The emerging philosophy goes even further than ecumenism with Rome, however. Because they adhere to the idea that truth is unknowable, they don't agree that they are the light of the world that needs to shine in the darkness. Instead, they believe in entering into conversation with other religions on equal terms. Brian McLaren writes, Ultimately, I hope Jesus will save Buddhism, Islam and every other religion, including the Christian religion, which often seems to need saving about as much as any other religion does. He also says, I must add though, that I don't believe making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion. It may be advisable in many, not all circumstances, to help people become followers of Jesus and remain with their Buddhist, Hindu or Jewish contexts. In the following quote, he also places Jesus on a level with Muhammad, saying, And during his lifetime, Abraham, like Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, had an encounter with God that distinguished him from his contemporaries and propelled him into a mission, introducing a new way of life that changed the world. How appropriate that the three Abrahamic religions begin with a journey into the unknown. We have seen that Muhammad did have an encounter with something, but it wasn't God, and that Islam does not stem from the same Abrahamic root as Judeo-Christianity. But what McLaren is leaning towards in these quotes is in fact universalism, the idea that you can find God through any religion. Spencer Burke agrees, saying, when I say I'm a universalist, what I really mean is that I don't believe you have to convert to any particular religion to find God. As I see it, God finds us, and it has nothing to do with subscribing to any particular religious view. The May-June 2000 issue of Watchman's Trumpet magazine elaborates on what this means. Messianic Muslims, who continue to read the Quran, visit the mosque and say their daily prayers but accept Christ as their saviour, are the products of the strategy which is being tried in several countries. They continued a life of following the Islamic requirements, including mosque attendance, fasting and Quranic reading, besides getting together as a fellowship of Muslims who acknowledge Christ as the source of God's mercy for them. Mike Oppenheimer of Let Us Reason Ministries has done some research on how this new idea of missions works out. He says something very telling. Can a Christian now call himself a Muslim? The word Muslim is made up of two words, Islam and Mu. Muslim does not just mean submission, it means submission to the God Allah, not the Lord Jesus Christ or Yahweh. Can a Muslim be called a Christian and walk with Allah? This seems to make no doctrinal or practical sense, unless they change the names and the meaning. This only brings confusion. Why do this when you can introduce Yahweh as the true God without any baggage and shuffling around in names, nature or description? The answer is that you may not see the same results. This is what this is all about, isn't it? Results. Pragmatism. The end justifies the means. There's that phrase again, the end justifies the means. Do anything to get the required results. It's the occult way. And remember, this is what the Catholic Church did in pagan Rome. They basically said, keep your paganism, but let's just change some names and try to throw Jesus into the mix. All that they introduced was paganism with a Christian mask. But what fellowship can light have with darkness? Rob Bell recently published his book, Love Wins, in which he speculates in his uniquely non-committal, hypothetical, fuzzy, wishy-washy, self-contradictory way that in the end everyone will reach heaven. He says, People come to Jesus in all sorts of ways. Sometimes people use his name, other times they don't. Acts 4.12 contradicts Bell, saying, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Here are some other quotes from emerging church leaders in favour of this idea that people don't need to change their faith in order to attain heaven. Firstly, Leonard Sweet says, New light embodiment means to be in connection and in formation with other faiths. One can be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ without denying the flickers of the sacred and followers of Yahweh or Kali or Krishna. Rick Warren says, I happen to know people who are followers of Christ in other religions. Peter Kreeft says, Allah is not another God. We worship the same God. The same God, the very same God we worship in Christ, is the God of the Jews and the Muslims. Alice Bailey says the same thing. I would point out that when I use the phrase, 
followers of the Christ, I refer to all those who love their fellow men, irrespective of creed or religion. Can we see how closely the words and ideas of the emerging church movement mimic those of occultists? Alice Bailey also says, The reason he has not come again is that the needed work has not been done by his followers in all countries. His coming is largely dependent, as we shall later see, upon the establishing of right human relations. The church has hindered and is not helped because of its fanatical zeal to make Christians of all peoples and not followers of Christ. It has emphasized theological doctrine and not love. So the problem is that we have been emphasizing truth too much. The emerging church agrees. Notice also here that Bailey makes a distinction between the term Christian and Christ follower. The emerging movement has encouraged us to drop the term Christian in favour of Christ follower, which is a looser term. Remember, many people followed Jesus around Israel when he preached, but not all that followed accepted his claim to be God. Many of those that followed were in fact Pharisees. Following from a distance is not enough. We were bought with his blood and are now slaves to Christ. Nothing less. Here Bailey also alludes to the fact that we have been the barrier to the coming of the Antichrist because of our uncompromising determination to see that people hear about the gospel truth and become Christians. The emerging church follows the advice of the occultists like Bailey, however, and instead of giving people the truth, they tell them that they can keep whatever religion they have, but just add Christ. But which Christ is it? The Christ of ecumenism with Rome and with Babylon is not the Christian Christ. Emerging church leader Erwin McManus wrote, My goal is to destroy Christianity as a world religion and be a re-catalyst for the movement of Jesus Christ. Some people are upset with me because it sounds like I'm anti-Christian. I think they might be right. Of course, you cannot be in relationship with the Christ of the Bible while simultaneously remaining in the confines of a false religion rooted in Babylon, worshipping satanic idols and believing in doctrines of demons. You must leave that religion completely and give your life to Jesus, not just add him on. The kingdom of light has no partnership with the kingdom of darkness. The only Christ that you can be in relationship with under this system is the false Jesus, the false Christ, the one spoken about by Alice Bailey, the Antichrist. The emergent church are duping people into believing they are saved as a Buddhist or Muslim just because they have tacked a false Christ onto the end. So when emergents talk about bridging the gap to non-Christians, they aren't talking about reaching them with the pure gospel, they are talking about compromise. Leonard Sweet explains, The key to navigating post-modernity's choppy, crazy waters is not to seek some balance or safe middle ground, but to ride the waves and bridge the opposites, especially where they converge in reconciliation and illumination. Followers of the emergent ideal, therefore, take the approach that to reach the world you have to immerse yourself in the world, to enjoy the things the world enjoys, to go to the places the world goes, to indulge in popular culture. What we find in these churches is that the world is coming into the church rather than the church going into the world. People involved in the emerging movement have to ask themselves, who is evangelizing who here? We have been instructed to be in the world, but in no sense of the world. It is impossible to immerse yourself in an ever more polluted culture and not be affected. We will become deceived with the standards of the world unless we keep ourselves holy before God. Finally, because the emerging church believes that doctrinal truth is essentially unknowable, the only real substance they believe Christianity has to offer the world is found in social action or social justice. If it's arrogant of Christians to claim that we have the one and only route to everlasting life, and we can't offer hope for eternal salvation with certainty, and if everyone's going to be saved through their own faiths anyway by just tacking Christ onto the end, they assume that will take care of itself, and instead their ultimate goal becomes making the world world a better place. They believe in the same man-made utopian ideal long held by occultists and think that paradise can be achieved here on earth by social activism and that that is all Christians really have to offer the world. The deception here is particularly powerful because of course Christians should be doing all those things. They should be feeding the hungry and giving to the poor. But the underlying philosophy behind these actions for the emerging church is that we can build God's kingdom ourselves and that we are in the process of evolving towards a utopian society that abolishes true faith in Christ and which joins hands with the Babylonian religion. The kingdom that man makes on this earth will be the Antichrist's kingdom. We know that. 
The Bible tells us clearly. We've heard Alice Bailey talking about creating the perfect conditions for the return of their Christ by all the religions abandoning Christianity and coming together under one system. What I hope I've done is show how the emerging movement is playing its role in drawing Christians into that with powerfully deceptive lies that are mixed with truth. Before we end the emerging church section, I should also point out that the idea of man establishing a utopia before Christ returns fits in with a theory that Christians call post-millennialism. I don't like using theological jargon, but it basically means that we'll create God's kingdom which rules the world peacefully for a thousand years, and then Jesus will return at the end of those thousand years. The opposite view is called premillennialism, and this is the idea that Jesus will come back and himself will establish his own kingdom which will usher in a thousand year period of peace. As you can see, Christians who hold to the post-millennialism view, the idea that we can create world peace ourselves, may, and I emphasise the word may, be at risk of being drawn into the pagan attempts to build a man-made utopia. I believe it is clearly the biblical stance that Jesus will establish his own kingdom prior to the millennial reign. Our job between now and his return is simply to make sure that as many as possible will be ready to meet him as their Lord and Saviour when he comes.